Greetings viewers and voyeurs with Got That Funk. Now, as most of you know by now, I'm sure, I am an American citizen who's lived in the UK since 1989. So this is my home now. And even though this is my home, I don't often wax on about British politics here on my YouTube channel. When I talk politics here on YouTube, I tend to keep it to my own country. Having said that, as a long-term resident of Britain, I do have some pretty strong opinions about British politics. Um, and every once in a while, I do feel entitled to uh, vent them here on my YouTube channel. And that's what this video is going to be. Now, I particularly would like to hear from members of my audience who are uh, resident in any EU country, but particularly my British audience. Obviously, if you're from any place else in the world, you're more than free to comment. Don't get me wrong. Um, but I particularly want you to comment if you're British or if you've spent significant time living in the UK. Because... The question as to whether or not the UK should remain a member of the European Union is going to be on everybody's lips for most of this year, since the British population has a chance to vote in an open referendum as to whether or not they would like the country to stay as a member of the European Union. Now, for those of you who live outside of Europe and don't know too much about this situation, let me just give you a very brief historical rundown. In the aftermath of World War II, uh, a few European countries banded together to create an economic community where they could trade with one another without trade restrictions in order to make it less likely that war would erupt between member states because they would be economically dependent on one another. That was the original vision for the EU way back in the late 50s. And it's my understanding, and I'm not going to look any of this stuff up, I'm just going to go by what I recall uh, gleaning off the media over the past 26 years, but... It's my understanding that the EU started off with six member nations signing the Treaty of Rome, and then it went up from that to seven, and then up from that to 12. Now, when I moved to this country in 1989, uh, there was no EU at, at, at that time. It was called the EEC at that time, which is short for European Economic Community. And at that time, the, uh, the goal was still pretty much uh, free trade uh, without restriction across European borders. But as a result of the 1992 Maastricht Treaty, which was negotiated for this country by the Conservative Party under John Major, um, they did away with the term EEC and created the term European Union, or EU. And there was an awful lot of concern amongst Tories uh, at that time that uh, the phrase ever closer union being in the Maastricht Treaty was problematic. They thought that there were certain parties uh, in Europe, particularly the French and Germans, who were trying to create a super state, you know, a sort of United States of Europe, as it were, rather than an economic community. And as a result of, uh, you know, conservative concerns it, uh, over the Maastricht Treaty, um, the British government at that time managed to negotiate uh, an opt-out clause. So the uh, Maastricht Treaty made it uh, possible, was the one that announced that we're going to, European countries are going to work towards ever closer union. That was one part of it. Another part of it was it created the uh, European common currency, which didn't actually come into circulation until around about the turn of the century, plus or minus a year. But uh, Britain negotiated an opt-out clause in the Master Treaty. Uh, so when the time came for the European uh, common currency to come into play, Europe, could, uh, sorry, Britain could opt in or opt out. And as they decided to opt out, uh, this country still has uh, the pound as its currency, whereas other European countries use the euro. It's my understanding, and I could be wrong, but it's my understanding that uh, another aspect of the Maastricht Treaty was that it uh, tore down barriers for travel within Europe so that... Uh, members of any uh, citizens of any European country could travel freely within the European community. They didn't, you didn't need a visa anymore to travel from one country to another. You didn't need a visa anymore to move from one country to another. And if you're going to move, you have to be able to work. So you don't need a visa anymore to uh, work in a different European country. So Brits who want to go and live, for example, in the south of Spain and live in the sunshine can go and do that. They can go over there, start a business, don't need a, any kind of a visa for that. They can live there, buy property, don't need any kind of a visa for that. And, and Britons live in their thousands in the south of Spain. 
There's also a large British contingent in Brittany, which is in the north of France and other parts of Europe as well. So it's not as if British people don't go out into Europe and take advantage of the free movement of labor uh, across Europe. They do. Um, and I think that's worth pointing out because most of the people that I know who object to uh, Britain being part of the EU object on the basis that uh, Britain has too many immigrants coming in from other EU nations. Now in the 90s at first that didn't seem to be too much of an issue, but uh, people knew it was going to become an issue because uh, the European Union has had as part of its goal to expand itself to include more and more countries. Countries that qualify and meet certain criteria are invited into the European Union and it's a process. It's not like you can just flick a switch and now you're a member. But once that process does begin, you do accrue certain rights to your sovereign country, uh, one of which is the free movement of labor out of your country and into other European member states. And so there has been a large influx of uh, Eastern Europeans coming to the UK, especially when the uh, EU expanded in, into Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and, and so on. And more recently with Bulgaria, Romania, and Moldova coming into the EU. We've had an awful lot of Eastern Europeans from those countries coming over. And of course this puts a, a strain on housing, it puts a strain on um, the unemployment situation and so forth, uh, the healthcare system, education system, everything. And people who object to membership of the EU seem to object almost solely on the issue that too many migrants are coming over, in their words. Now, my own opinion as an immigrant myself is I don't really have a problem with uh, immigration per se because it's my experience, my observation that the, uh, the lion's share, and by lion's share I mean over 99% of people who come over from uh, Eastern European countries come over here to work. Uh, they're not coming over here because of the generous benefit system that the UK has which is the perception an awful lot of English people seem to have. An awful lot of English people seem to come over, think they come over here just to soak off the system. I'm not saying it never happens, but in my experience, the Eastern Europeans who are coming over here come over here to work. And quite frankly, um, I work in construction and the Eastern Europeans bust their ass uh, to get those jobs and to keep those jobs. So, you know, I don't think uh, it's fair to say that people are coming over here just to be uh, benefit scroungers. <laughs> Um, anyway, I digress. Um, my point is, as I say, most of the people that I know who object to the EU object because they don't like the situation with immigrants. My own objection to the EU, such as it is, is the European Commission. Now, again, for people who are outside of the EU and don't know much about it, um, the, the EU is not really meant to be some sort of United States of Europe. Um, but it does have democratic institutions, uh, you know, uh, which create European laws, which apply to all member states. And uh, there's the European Court of Justice and the Courts of Human Rights. There's the European Parliament, which is where most of the laws are drafted. And the executive branch is the EU Commission. And it's the EU Commission that I've got a problem with because that's not democratically elected. That is appointed by member states. Their governments appoint their ministers to the... Uh, Council of Europe. And a significant portion of laws that emanate from Europe are crafted in the European Commission um, and as such they don't really have enough democratic accountability, at least not from my point of view, or from my tastes. But my problem with the EU Commission is not sufficient for me to advocate for Britain to leave the EU. So if you're British What's your thoughts? Do you already know which way you're going to vote when the vote comes up later this year? Are you going to want to be in or out of the EU? If you want to be out of the EU, I've got a couple of questions for you. Is the immigration situation your main beef with the EU? If so, tell me why. Uh, if not, tell me why as well. But if your problem with the EU is the free movement of labor across Europe, are you comfortable with Brits uh, who live abroad in Europe being sort of kicked out and made forced to relocate back here and repatriate themselves to Britain? Not that I think that would necessarily happen, but what happens if, if, if you vote to get out of the EU, what do you think should happen to the migrants who have already come over here as legal immigrants who are working legally 
as immigrants, uh, should they all be forced to repatriate themselves back to their home countries? Or should you just like stop the immigration, you know, draw a line and say, okay, no more coming over without a work visa and then make restrictions on work visas? Because here's the thing. I think that just the vote to get out of the EU won't necessarily stop migrants from coming over because if you vote to leave the EU, what you're really voting for is for the government to negotiate its way out of the treaty obligations that it's signed up to in the EU. So there's going to be a massive negotiation by the government with the European Union uh, discussing the terms of the exit. It's not as if voting to leave the EU will nullify all laws that have emanated from the EU over the past sort of 50 years or whatever, or if, if, even if you just go back to the Maastricht Treaty, uh, so 30 years, 25 years, whatever. Um, yeah, it's not as if voting to leave the EU is going to, you know, at the stroke of a pen, uh, nullify everything that uh, Britain has as a result of being a member of the EU. For example, under the Labour government, um, the European uh, Human Rights Act was adopted as part of British law. Do you want to keep that as part of British law or not? You're going to have to figure that out. You're going to have to figure out where your immigration policy is going to be and on what basis. You're going to have to negotiate this shit with other countries. It's not like you can just vote and have everything come to a screeching halt and become a fully sovereign nation again. I do think some of the, uh, some of the uh, people jockeying to keep Britain in the EU are using false arguments, which I don't think actually helps their cause. Uh, false arguments emanate from both sides of this, though. So I'd be interested to find out where my audience is on this subject. If you're British in particular, I do want to hear from you. Are you going to vote to stay in? Are you going to vote to get out? Tell me why either way. I look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Video responses would be more than welcome as well. Landon Cole, I'm looking at you. Anyway, thanks for watching this video. And until next time, may all your ups and downs be ups.